Hello, fellow Gators, and welcome to our first ever virtual wine tasting event. Um, I, and I, like I said, I am a fellow Gator, uh, class of 1993. I was looking through the guest list today and I saw that there were a couple others from my year. So, you know, special recognition to uh, the class of 1993. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm uh, coming to you from uh, Lake Tahoe. A uh, couple of friends uh, are, were nice enough to uh, let me come over and bring some wine because they didn't think it would be quite appropriate for me to drink three bottles of, of wine myself. So they've uh, agreed to, to share it with me. Um, but let us know where you're joining us from. One of the silver linings we found from all of from this situation is that we have gotten very good at um, now starting to put on virtual events. And this has been our, our, our most popular. This and when we had some family forums for parents of new students. So we see that our priorities um, amongst uh, our uh, San Francisco State family is our students and wine, which we're, we're very okay with. So, um, how we got to know about Seha Vineyards is we have a, a, an alumna, uh, Dahlia Seha, and I, she might be able to join us later on tonight, but she uh, is, is married to another alumnus of San Francisco State University, and they just welcomed a baby, and so she's taking a break, and just in her honor, I looked up what a baby alligator is called. If anyone knows, put that in the chat. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and uh, so we're very grateful. It, this is basically how a conversation goes with Dahlia or Seha Vineyards when we ask them for something. We get on the phone and say, can you have, and we don't even get the words out. And they're like, yes, whatever you want. So it, the same thing happened today. Um, and if you don't know, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer right now. Look, uh, it's a hatchling. That's the baby alligator. So they've had their hatchling. And I've already seen that people are joining us from Washington, D.C. and L.A. and in the Sunset District, Santa Barbara. This is fantastic. We never, in New York, we never would have been able to, to get together like this um, uh, without doing this virtually. So thank you for all being here. And... We, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Amelia Seha, who's going to be uh, our presenter today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Amelia, and this is very brief because I could go on forever. I mean, her list of accomplishments is just astonishing. So, uh, Amelia was born in Las Flores, Jalisco, Mexico, and immigrated to the United States in 1967 uh, to join her father, who was a farm worker in uh, Rutherford in the Napa Valley. She fell in love with grape growing, and throughout her teenage and college years during school vacations, she continued to come back to the vineyards. And in fact, she studied uh, history and literature at uh, uh, UC San Diego, so all within the California uh, system family. Uh, Amelia and her husband Pedro married in 1980, and then along with uh, other members of the family, they uh, purchased their first property in Carneros uh, in the Napa Valley and planted their first grapes in 1986. Uh, at Amelia Pedro, her brother-in-law, and his wife founded Seha Vineyards in 1999. Today they own 115 acres in the Napa and Sonoma Valleys, and Seha Vineyards produces 7,000 cases a year, with her brother-in-law serving as the winemaker. Uh, she has become an impassioned advocate for the value and fair treatment of her farm workers, and in 2016, uh, Amelia received the Dolor Dolores Huerta Farm Worker Justice Award for her successful advocacy for worker protection standards on pesticides. And in 1999, she was the, uh, the first Mexican-American woman ever elected to be president of a winery. In 2005, she, the California legislature recognized Emilia as the woman of the year for breaking the gas ceiling in a very competitive business. And in fact, just today, she, uh, there's an article about her in Bloomberg Magazine, and we're gonna, we're gonna include a link to that um, uh, in the chat, and we'll also, in a follow-up email, we'll make sure we have 
that. Um, right before I turn it over to her, I forgot to mention another event we'd love for you to join is on November 6th. We're going to be having our Alumni Hall of Fame uh, celebration where we're going to be uh, inducting two more wonderful alumni, Netta Nobari, who's a businesswoman, philanthropist, a humanitarian, and, and established our Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies, and um, Jonas Rivera, who is the, who works for, is a producer for Pixar, and is the first uh, U.S. born Latin X producer to win two Academy Awards. His first one was for Inside, uh, Inside Out, and just uh, another one just this year for um, Toy Story 4. So, we have all kinds of wonderful, exciting things. We have all kinds of wonderful going on at the university, ways to support our uh, students. We're gonna include a link uh, a little bit too if you would like to support our students through the Hope Crisis Fund. We've noticed a lot of students need a lot of help with some basic needs and so that's one way to do it. Um, but without further ado, Amelia combines the best of what she finds in food and drink, tradition and innovation. Her family's dedication to environmentally conscious business practices, sustainable agriculture, and gentle handling of the grapes in the cellar can be tasted in every sip of their legacy estate-grown wines. So without further ado, Amelia Seha. Nicole, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's so great to uh, see you and I'm delighted that you're enjoying our fabulous vinos in beautiful Lake Tahoe. And thank you, uh, San Francisco uh, State University Alumni Association for inviting me uh, to this virtual tasting to bring you uh, Napa and Sonoma to your living room. So, um, and I hope that soon we can toast together uh, and our, our tasting room in Sonoma is open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays from 11 to 5, and you are invited uh, to come and visit us. So, muchísimas gracias. And Nicole, um, I, we do, well, I do have a surprise. Uh, Dalia Seja Swedelson, my uh, beloved daughter, is here with uh, the little uh, gator. Is it Chen? Um, well, anyway, a hatchling, a hatchling. <laughs> with, with, with Luna Isabella, the newest hatchling. And here is Dalia and Luna Isabella. Hi. Hi, you guys. This is so beauty. Luna Isabella. Say hola, mamacita. Hola, que linda. <laughs> yes, yeah, she is almost five months old and also very excited about the possibilities of attending San Francisco State in her future. <laughs> well, we would be happy, happy to have her. <laughs> oh. But no, thank you so much. We are honored that you would like to know more about our family history and taste through our beautiful wines with my beautiful mamacita here. But this has been so special for me, three generations right here of strong Latina Seja women. And so we're just so proud of our rich Mexican heritage, our very humble beginnings, and now sharing our story with you and with the world is, is something that, you know, we just, we, we love. We're very passionate about this industry and about giving back to the community. So thank you very much for hosting a Say Helping Yards virtual tasting. And she's the next generation, and yes. she's generation, and she's already in love with being in the outdoors. She's already smell. Well, we allow I her to, about to say love wine. No, Not yet. no, <laughs> smell like the aromatics <laughs> wine, and uh, she. We just allow her to smell flowers, and she was touching the grape leaves today. And yesterday, we were actually filmed for. Uh, uh, a coffee table book and uh, she the photographer captured Luna Isabella like uh, holding uh, one of the twigs of the vines that are turning color here around our home it's very very special yes beautiful beautiful well welcome all of you this is a beautiful shot of three generations <laughs> yes thank you and you are in the best of hands with with my mom and you guys are gonna have a blast so ask all the questions, vino related or not, 
Um, and thank you again. I'm going to say my adieu because this little one needs to, to go have a little bit of a, a bite to eat. Um, but thank you again. Muchas gracias. Thank you for talking about it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my heart is full. Um, this uh, in in Jalisco, I'll, I know that I have a few minutes to speak about our story, um, and I just want to say that in Jalisco we have a saying, "Mujeres chingonas," which literally means badass women, and I think it's a a great description of uh, women across the planet uh, that take the lead in uh, very. Uh, male-dominated industries and actually change it. So I am thrilled to uh, share my journey from Mexico to the Napa Valley. So my father had been coming to the U.S. since he married my mother back in the late 40s and uh, but he was never, um, he never wanted to participate in the Bracero uh, work program because he told me years later that he never wanted to be an indentured servant. So he came to the U.S. undocumented because no human being is illegal. And uh, finally, in the early 60s, he was able to get his uh, residency card, his green card. And since then, he began the process of uh, applying for my sister, my mother, and me to join him here in California. So fast forward to 1967, the day I actually finished sixth grade in my little village of uh, Las Flores in the state of Jalisco, in way in Los Altos de Jalisco, in the highlands of Jalisco, about three hours north of Guadalajara. Um, my, my father had applied uh, to uh, the U.S. consulate in Mexico City uh, for our residency card, and six weeks later, we actually received it. It was very easy at that time. So I actually crossed the border on a bittersweet date on September 11, 1967, in Calexico, and arrived in Napa Valley uh, that evening. So that date is quite meaningful to, uh, uh, to me, and now, of course, it's also ingrained as uh, the tragic event of uh, 2001. So um, it was during harvest and my father was a vineyard foreman and he introduced me to grape growing. He invited me the very first weekend to go and see what it was all about. And uh, another family had just arrived from the state of Michoacan. His friend, Pablo, who had also been coming to the U.S. As, and was a migrant worker just like my father, they had met throughout the years and both independent of each other, uh, fell in love with Napa Valley because it could have been Fresno. I mean, nothing against Fresno, but Napa Valley is really lovely. So um, I met the very first weekend, I, met, I, I was not only introduced to grape growing, but I also met my future partners and ultimately my husband as well. Um, Armando, Pedro, and Nacho, three brothers, uh, and myself, my dad, showed us how to harvest grapes. And um, that first day I made like $3.50, so I felt so uh, independent and I felt so rich that uh, I, not only did I love the grapes, uh, I mean, they're perfectly ripened, succulent, they were delicious, that I, but, but I also made some money and I told my father I was going to have a vineyard of my own someday. So um, Pedro and I remained friends throughout uh, high school, even though I went back to Mexico to go to prep school there. And then when I came back, I went to a different high school, but our families were friends. And I guess he liked me since we were, since we met, but we started dating again when we were both juniors in college. And we were married in 1980, and every weekend we, we spent, um, because we lived in Silicon Valley because of our degrees, I studied history and literature at UC San Diego, and he studied engineering in Northern California. So Silicon Valley was the ideal location for us to live. 
Um, and we had great jobs, but we didn't have any money. Uh, so we spent every weekend um, for the first two years looking for land. And finally, we were able to put an offer on a property in Carneros, which is in the southernmost part of Napa and Sonoma. And the varietals that thrive in this area are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, uh, two great varietals that are quite challenging to grow because they thrive in very shallow clay loom soils and under difficult growing conditions. You have to have uh, cool nights, but then just the right amount of uh, heat in the late afternoon to properly mature these grapes. So Carneros is the ideal location because of the maritime influence from uh, San Francisco, San Pablo Bay. And so we purchased our property in 1983. We finally were able to develop it in 1986. Our first harvest was in 1988. And since that very first harvest, we started making wine uh, because you, one is allowed to make wine, not for commercial purposes, uh, since uh, even during prohibition, but it couldn't exceed like a barrel, which translates to around 23, 000, uh, 23 cases. Uh, between 25 and 20 cases. And so we knew that eventually we wanted to launch our own wine brand, but um, we, we, we needed to really establish ourselves first as great growers. So by, by the mid-90s, we had acquired around 115 acres and developed them ourselves uh, in both the Napa and Sonoma counties. So we already grew, by then we already grew uh, not only Chardonnay, but we also uh, had planted Sauvignon Blanc in Sonoma Coast, as well as Sarnese, which is a little known Italian grape varietal from the Piemonte uh, region in northwestern Italy. And then we had also planted besides Pinot Noir, also Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Syrah. So um, by the mid-90s, we knew we were ready uh, to launch our own brand. So, but no one was willing to drop what they were doing to start it from scratch. Until that time, we sold every single, uh, our, all of our uh, harvests were sold to renowned vintners in both Napa and Sonoma. So it wasn't until 1999 when I left my job in the wine industry and uh, that entire summer uh, I wrote the articles of incorporation and in September of uh, 1999 I was elected by my partners as president of Savignas and it, it's a historical uh, moment because there were not a lot of women in the wine industry, even less Latina women. Uh, so it, that literally broke all of the barriers. And I'm very proud and I take it very seriously because it literally um, paved the way for so many more women uh, to get into this industry and more women of color. So it's, it's been a very exciting journey. And um, in, in, in 2001, we released 750 cases, which I pretty much hand sold to all of uh, the restaurants that we love to go eat and a lot, to our friends and some uh, on, on premise accounts uh, like wine shops, etc. And in, immediately the following year, we were named the best new winery by over 90 of the world's most prestigious wine writers. And we increase our production uh, every year, but we don't want to increase our production anymore until we uh, construct this uh, mission uh, style, architecturally mission style winery here in Carneros in, uh, in uh, Napa Valley. Uh, we do have a wine tasting salon right on Highway 12 between Napa and Sonoma that is open uh, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays from 11 to 5. And of course, we follow all of the uh, protocol guidelines uh, to make sure that our team is safe and all of our guests that visit us are safe too. So definitely have to come and check it out. So what... What we decided to do from the very beginning was that um, we were going to build our brand 
our way and not relying on like uh, wine critics to give our wines point, uh, but rather uh, make wine not, that, that would actually pair well with food and not just any food. It's very easy to uh, produce wines to pair with uh, like Mediterranean cuisine. But how about wine to pair with Mexican, Latin American, Asian, Mexation, world cuisine? There was nothing like that when we launched our brand. So um, it, we knew it was going to be a little bit more uh, difficult because once a wine writer, an influential wine writer gives you wine, anything over 90 points, basically all of the wine writer, writer's followers, they like our sheep, they follow and they buy those wines. But uh, I, well, our, our partners um, and I, we don't really like those wines because they tend to be these like big, robust, over-extracted, high alcohol fruit bumps. And those wines, if you like them, you should continue drinking them, but they really don't pair well with food. High alcohol does not pair well with food. It's, it's, it's acid, it's, um, this, this wonderful, um, balanced wine that pairs well with food. So, um, we decided we were going to go our way and we're so pleased that we did because now uh, we've, we've introduced wines to people that have been um, purposely uh, not never been invited to join into this most democratic of, uh, of, of, of like social rituals of eating uh, with your family and your friends, dining, sharing a meal, um, which is what brings people together. And in our Mexican culture, everything revolves around the kitchen uh, and multi-generations cooking together. And that's what we wanted to bring and introduce uh, to the world, uh, that there's room at the table for wine, regardless of what the menu is as long as the wine is balanced. So that's what we've been able to do. And a uh, testament to that is that we've been featuring in not only in today's, actually in Business Week in Bloomberg um, News Online and also in, in print, uh, but uh, we've been featured, we are the only winery ever featured on the front page of the Sunday New York Times. That not even our first uh, growth, uh, uh, Bordeaux or um, Mondavi or any other winery. And it's a testament that um, people pay attention to us, number one, because we know more than anyone you will ever meet that collectively within just my partners, we have over 150 years of great growing and winemaking experience. And our wines compete with the best in the world. Yes, it's wonderful that we also have a non-traditional story that we started working the vineyards and now we have one of the most respected brands in the country, but literally we get attention because our wines and the combination not only of great wines, but also our great story. So um, I was asked to uh, do something really fun that I've done numerous times with uh, Riddle glasses. And, and Riddle is a brand of glass glassware that was actually literally invented uh, before Second World War and during Second World War uh, by immigrants to in Switzerland, German immigrants in Switzerland by the Riddle family. Uh, um, and like dining out and using different shape uh, glassware allowed the, the Riddle family members to experience something really wonderful that uh, Different wines exhibited different aromatics and flavor profiles depending upon the shape of the bowl of the glass. So they actually have um, built this amazing empire, building all of this glassware uh, for very for for pretty much every varietal. So today we're I'm actually going to taste um, the Sauvignon Blanc, our our twenty. Uh, 19 Sauvignon Blanc from our Sonoma Coast, uh, which very soon we're going to be able to call from the Petaluma Gap, which was approved by the Trade and Tax Bureau within the last uh, three years. Um, and, and I'm going to be able to taste it. This is what a, a, a glass for, from Riddle uh, that is made specifically for Sauvignon Blanc looks like. 
And this is also a riddle glass uh, that is from the restaurant series that is typically used by most restaurateurs because it's sort of like for a universal glass that you can, all, most wines taste pretty okay in this glass. And then I also have here just a regular stemless glass that pretty much everyone has. But see how the bowls are a little bit bigger? I like uh, to use glassware that the bowls are, are slightly bigger than the ones like from the 80s and uh, 90s because you want to make sure that there's enough surface area so that you are able to swirl uh, the wine properly. So I'm going to do first, I'm going to pour myself um, some wine in all three glasses and then I'm going to smell uh, the wine, the aromatics, and then I'm going to taste it. And, and it will taste better in the actual stemware that is made for Sauvignon Blanc. But you don't need to get have any of this glassware. I mean, if you have just uh, even just this glass, this is perfect because as long as the bowl is, is wide and, and tall. Um, but my ultimate glass is this, the restaurant series, because see how much larger the bowl is? And even sparkling wine, uh, the flutes are not really made. Well, they, they just look sexier and more beautiful. And right away, you know that it's uh, champagne or sparkling wine or spumante or cava. But actually, you, ex you experience the aromatics better also on this uh, uh, stemware, on the uh, restaurant series uh, from Riddle. Plus, all of this stemware is lead free. Initially, most of the stemware from Riddle had lead, and even today, some of it does, and it's much more fragile. But this little, I dropped it actually from standing up, but I'm only five feet tall. And sometimes it has broken a couple of times, but most of the time, it ha I mean, they survive. And you can wash them in just your uh, dishwasher. So they're very, very sturdy. So I recommend it. And they don't pay me anything. It's just that I really like to enjoy wine in the right glass. So let me pour the wine. And I have to warn you, my husband always accuses me of uh, that I can really speak for hours at a time. And I can and I do often. So I'm just going to pour myself roughly about an ounce. See, um, about an ounce of wine in each of the wine glasses, the three wine glasses that I'm going to be tasting uh, this Sauvignon Blanc from. And then I'm going to first smell the aromatics on all three. And I, I already know, because I've done this so many times, that I would be able to detect just the, the, uh, the exact very... Uh, varietal specific aromatics in the Sauvignon Blanc glass. But I'm going to test it on the other two that are not just for Sauvignon Blanc. First in your everyday glass. So I'm just going to smell it. And what you want to do, see how if you only serve yourself from an ounce to an ounce and a half, you're really able to swirl. And you explore wine you, through your senses. So visual to make sure that the color is right for the varietal, which in this case, see, it's like struggle, and that is exactly what Sauvignon Blanc co color is supposed to be. So swirl, then you literally do stick your nose all the way in the glass. Well, it's, it's bright, it's fresh, but, but it's a little bit muted. I cannot detect all of the citrusy notes that I'm not going to be able to detect in the other gl two glasses. Oh, but it's, it's definitely very crisp, bright, and fresh. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smell the one in the riddle that is the uh, restaurant series or the universal series. And see how great? Oh, and if you learn to hold the stem like this and see, just use your wrist to swirl, you'll be the biggest hit at the next party. Trust me. Oh, yeah. So see? It's fresh, very fresh and crisp, but here I'm able to like uh, detect, like, like when you squeeze a lemon or, a, or any citrus, and you know the little oil that's sort of like, like um, uh, that you smell right away? I'm able to smell that. 
in this glass. So this is definitely better than this. And now I'm going to smell the, the in the Sauvignon Blanc glass. Oh, see, it's the difference is like from here to the moon. This is the, now I can detect so much more. And there's also like a hints of the tropics, maybe like guava, guayaba, and a little bit of vanilla because this wine was stainless steel fermented uh, to maintain its, its uh, just so that, it, so that it's not influenced by the oak too much. But we did place it in neutral French oak just for about three weeks, just to give it that um, rounder mouthfeel. But also, now I can detect just a, just a little, like way in the background, a little bit of vanilla, which comes from that small amount of time that is spent in oak, in neutral oak. That means that it's been used uh, before. So this, the aromatics in, in the Sauvignon Blanc glass is by far richer, and I'm able to detect a, a lot more of the aromatics. Now I'm gonna taste it. I'm gonna taste the one uh, first in, in the regular everyday glass. Oh, this is what Sauvignon Blanc is supposed to be. See, uh, the flavor, it's very crisp. It's a, it's a little bit tart. It's like saying, give me an oyster with a little bit of fire roasted tomatillo salsa or some enchilada suizas or some really creamy, uh, awesome cheeses from Alsace. It's delicious and, and it definitely continues. Uh, the aromatics are transferred onto the palate. It's, it's very, very refreshing. It's very clean. It's austere. It's divine. Now I'm going to taste it. And I already know that this is going to be, I'm going to be able to taste it. It's going to, I'm going to feel the weight a little bit more on my, on my palate. Oh yes. And I'm actually able to taste more of the citrus component as well. I wasn't able to detect it in this glass, but in this, yes. And it's not the grassy herbaceous civet, you know, capi, uh, that most New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs um, offer. I mean, if you like those, you should definitely drink those. Don't ever listen to anyone except your own palate, because you should only please uh, yourself. It's very, very nice. I mean, I really like it here, but I know this is going to give me the whole picture of this wine because it's the Sauvignon Blanc glass. Oh my gosh. It's, it's not only do I taste, it's more of that, you know, that, that lime that I absolutely adore, uh, but it, it does, it, on the back palate, it definitely does have that, a little bit of a richness of a, of, of guayaba that actually um, on our website, because I'm a chef too, um, there is a mousse de guayaba, because guayaba is my favorite fruit on the planet, because where I grew up, uh, we have like 100 different varieties. And with this, it's absolutely sublime. So this one, using the Sauvignon Blanc glass, literally, um, gives the exact characteristic of what Sauvignon Blanc is and should be. But you're able to enjoy it on any glass. You don't need to go out and buy yourself because uh, any of these glasses, because often um, there, you don't have enough room or one doesn't have enough room you know, in the cabinets uh, to store them. I do because this is my job and my passion. Um, and, and I have uh, we, a lot of glassware and we only use in our tasting room, we only actually only use uh, this one. And, and see, it's still, it's a really great, um, I think, um, uh, alternative to, uh, uh, to having, you, getting this, something like this with this glass shape 
is the best alternative uh, because you can enjoy all uh, wines in this. They will show a lot better than in any other glassware, in my experience. So this is all. And I know that there are a lot of uh, questions. Um, and I know that uh, uh, some of those questions are going to be asked um, by uh, Ken and, and his wonderful team uh, in a bit, uh, but because we still have to go through two of the wines, and I want to make sure we, we stay uh, on time. Um, if, if, um, so, oh, but I can't toss it. Well, I'm, but I have a, it's always good, like when you come to visit us, even though I feel it's sacrilegious, uh, to toss wine, especially this amazing quality. But, um, well, I'll have another sip. Oh, it's divine. But I'm definitely not tossing this one. Um, so, on this wine, and you don't need, um, you don't need to rinse your wine glass uh, when when you um, go from white to red. And actually, because often water, if you like rinse it, uh, often water, especially if it's seeded water, or if you have well water, it has so many more minerals that you're gonna have some off smell. So you can, you can literally just go from a lighter wine to the next wine and use the same glass. I never rinse my uh, wine glass with water. If in, especially if I only have one glass, I literally uh, just maybe, like if I'm going back, which I typically do like to cleanse my palate, when we go, well, not since the pandemic, but when we go uh, tastings, uh, when, and we host so many tastings and we participate in so many tastings that benefit our communities to raise awareness and much needed funds for education, healthcare, farmers, housing, etc. That I mean, we literally do hundreds and hundreds. And we can't wait to continue doing them and gather together and toast together. But I, I typically, even if I'm going from red to white, I might just pour a little bit of whatever white wine I'm going to have maybe just like literally uh just a little bit and then i just rinse it and i don't even toss it i just drink it because i'm typically i'm not driving either so see all i'm just going to make sure that all the sauvignon blanc is um uh gone and now i'm just going to pour the next wine which is the ceja bella flor rosé and bella flor literally means beautiful flower such an appropriate name for look at the color of this rosé. And this rosé is also from Sonoma Coast. Uh, from the same vineyard, we have own 65 acres there. The new ABA Petaluma Gap, which all of the wines are going to have from this point on. And it's also from the 2019 vintage. And the way that rosé is made is actually uh, from, a, from a red grape. But the color in wine comes from the skin. And the thicker the skin, the darker the color will be of the wine. So once the, the grapes are gently pressed, and the juice of a white grape and a red grape is exactly the same color, it's clear. Um, but the, to make the, the a red a wine red, you, we, uh, we allow that great, the juice to be in contact with the skins for uh, extended days. And sometimes we do extended maceration um, where we go in and, and we gently uh, mix in, you know, the skins, everything, so that you also, um, the wine is more complex, uh, having like uh, the right astringency and the tannins, etc. because tannins and also comes from the skin, also from the seeds, but as well from the skins. So we only allow the juice of Syrah, Syrah which is a, a varietal that comes from the uh, Rhone Valley near the Rhone River in France. Uh, we only allow the skins to be in contact with this juice for about uh, three to four hours. So see, you only, we only extract that rosé color. And this is such a fantastic wine to enjoy. Uh, for all year, all year long, you know, I love rosé all year long because it pairs well with 
pretty much everything. If you're invited to a dinner party and you have no idea what the menu is, well, there are three wines that you, my three wines, my go-to wines that I, I take, either a Pinot Noir because uh, our Pinot Noir pairs well with everything, seafood and you name it, a Rosé because it pairs well with everything or a sparkling wine because it pairs well with everything too. So, uh, plus for the holiday fair, oh, with turkey, with all of the apps that one loves during holidays, this is it. I just love it. It's just so refreshing and it's not sweet. The, in France, the number one wine that is consumed the most, people would think is like a, a Bordeaux wine or a Burgundy, either a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet. No, it's actually Rosé. It's uh, literally consumed all day. Uh, even you take, well, you go out to lunch and you could have an entire bottle because it's just light and refreshing and it pairs well with lunch. So I'm going to taste it in the uh, restaurant series riddle because I know this will show the best here. And see, I'm, this is probably about two ounces. And see how it swirl again. Oh, it smells like a fresh cut strawberry, but there's no residual sugar. This is a bone dry uh, rosé. Uh, it smells fruity, but then when you taste it, it's completely, completely dry. It's just very crisp and refreshing too. Oh, I can have it all day as well. Um, I spent a, a lot of time in France throughout the years, and uh, oh my gosh, we, I've had pretty much every rosé from every area in France. Um, it's delicious. Um, this, so, so uh, aromatically, it smelled initially just like a fresh cut strawberry, so fruity, but when I tasted it, it was, it was literally more like a... Um, uh, like a like a very tart red apple there's zero residual sugar it is just so inviting i mean a, a, a taste invites another one it's pretty pretty awesome so i encourage you to definitely don't only enjoy it during summer because it is pretty great all year long oh i hate to toss it now i'm gonna bring another glass into this picture because this is what a glass for Pinot Noir uh, the, uh, is exactly what it's supposed to look like. Well, what it looks like. So it's also, the bowl is much wider and shorter. A Bordeaux glass is as wide as this, but, but it doesn't narrow up so much and it's much taller. And we have some of those too. But trust me, this does, this, does the trick for to enjoy all wines. But I just wanted to show you that, I mean, look how big it is. I mean, it will take, even if you just buy eight glasses, it will take an entire um, area of your cabinet just to store the Pinot Noir glasses, which of course we do, because I really do enjoy uh, having Pinot Noir in this glass, because I love Pinot Noir, it's one of my favorite varietals. And we make two. So, as I have in years, we make a Carneros one, uh, which is the ideal location, but we also make a Sonoma Coast one. And I think I'm going to, why not? We have a little bit of time. I'm going to try uh, the next one, which is Arvino de Casa, which literally means wine of the house. And we've already trademarked that name. We were so surprised that it was still available because practically every alcoholic beverage Every name in every language is already uh, trademarked. It's really, really, really hard uh, to find a new name. And we've trademarked Bella Flor, which is a perfect name for our beautiful rosé. But we also have a Dulce Beso, which means sweet kiss. It's a late harvest wine. Um, and we make a, a couple of Bordeaux blends like Oxomo, uh, two Bordeaux blends that can only have I, the five of the great varietals that are grown that are native to Bordeaux and Bordeaux is in the southwest of uh, France. Uh, not only Cabernet Sauvignon but Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Bordeaux and Malbec. So as long as it's a mixture of any of those, any uh, proportions, then it's a Bordeaux blend. 
um, and we uh, we make a few blends because blends are really easy to pair with lots of different dishes too. So let's taste this. And we nicknamed this uh, Vino de Casa very lovingly, our breakfast, lunch, and dinner wine. You know why? Because on a late Sunday morning, I love chilaquiles, huevo rancheros. Oh, I love menudo too. And I don't really drink any other alcoholic beverage like mimosas. If I'm going to have uh, sparkling wine or champagne, I'm going to have it 100% by itself. No, it's not going to be inundated with um, orange juice. But if you do love mimosas, please continue having them. Uh, I love wine. And so chilaquiles, huevos rancheros, menudo, bring it on with ceja vino de casa. So this blend is a blend of a Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Syrah. And in France, it's against a lot to blend anything to Pinot Noir, which is a, a varietal that thrives in Burgundy. Um, and it's typically also called Red Burgundy. When you hear the word Red Burgundy, it's, I don't, everyone knows that it's Pinot Noir. And when you hear the word, it's uh, Bordeaux, well, it's probably Cabernet or Merlot. But so there is against a lot to blend anything to Pinot Noir, but not in the U.S. We can blend anything. The Trading Tax Bureau, the agency in Washington, D.C. that governs alcohol production and consumption and oh, it, it needs to change a little bit, but um, we are able to blend anything. But in France, all of those laws, French, uh, French laws have been, were established in the mid uh 1850s and they break them all the time trust me there's I, I read everything all the news and but we don't see how we actually tell you in the back that there is Pinot Noir, Syrah and Merlot and it is yummy you don't need a reason to have this wine it's so yummy you little you can also just place it if it's really warm where you live uh, I, I, I hate red wine served warm because it, it, all you taste is the alcohol. I love, I love red wine served between um, 60 and 62 degrees. And white wine, I hate it being served too cold because you don't taste or smell any of the aromatics. White wine should be served uh, between 56 and 60 degrees and red wine between 60 and 62 degrees. And that's exactly what this is being served. I'm also gonna pour a little on, because he has Pinot Noir, why not? I have this glass here, might as well do it. So let's try this Vino de Casa, yummy. This is literally, this is my go-to wine for pretty much anything. If I'm watching a movie, well, of course, our Chardonnay, which is non malo uh, and in my opinion is the best, in the universe, not just in the US, in the universe, because it's very, it's, it's sort of an oxymoron, it's both crisp uh, and rich at the same time, but it's not mellow, not the buttery, popcorn-y aromatics or flavor. It's creamy and very crisp and with popcorn while watching a movie, oh, I tell you, it's the best. But this, with uh, you uh, get a little hungry while watching a movie, some, uh, a little snack of just, chips, blue chips, which I love, and some of your favorite salsa, and a bottle or a glass or two of Ceja Vino de Casa is a perfect evening while watching a movie. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna smell in both of the glasses. So this is once again, uh, the, uh, the a restaurant series universal glass that I absolutely adore. Oh, and it's bright red, like bright red cherries from Washington State. And let's see in the Pinot Noir, because there is Pinot. I know that it's, it's probably going to taste also and smell better in this one. Oh, yeah, it's another world. Also, I can detect right away some of the uh, vanilla from the little oak that the wine was aged in. Now let's taste it and see. The tannins are there, but they're silky, smooth. Um, the, it's just so balanced. 
the acidity, the tannins, the alcohol, it's what a blend is supposed to be. It's lovely. And let's try it in the Pinot Noir glass. Mm. This, um, with this glass, you can actually detect uh, all of the characteristics like this equation, all of the variables that make up this equation of a red wine, you can actually detect all of them. It's just awesome. But um, we not only make these wines, we also make uh, a, a, a Merlot, which I absolutely adore. Um, and Merlot has been maligned because of a movie that came out in like 2004 or five. And, but Merlot as a varietal is really one of my, it's amazing. I love it because it's sort of in between a Pinot Noir and a Cabernet. And it's also really great with seafood, especially like salmon. And we also uh, make, uh, let, we make Metzli of Somo, uh, two Bordeaux blends. And Oxomo is the Aztec deity goddess of the night. And Metzli is uh, the Aztec deity go goddess of the moon. And my, my uh, nietecita's name is Luna, so it's so appropriate, Metzli. And then we also make a Mezcla 54, because uh, Mezcla means uh, mixture or blend. Uh, 54 because it was the very first year that my father happened to pass through Napa Valley. So that was, that's in his honor. Uh, I think it's so special and they're lovely. We make also a pork like wine that we call Dulce Amor, Sweet Love. Can you believe that was still available? So we trademark all of these words, uh, names. Um, and the Dulce Beso, the Lake Harvest, so turnstile wine, uh, two Pinot Noirs. And uh, we have a, a coupon code SFSU that is live until uh, 72 hours from now that you can, uh, when you go to, if, if you want to stock up for the holidays that are coming up or to give to your family and friends, because if you can't be together, you might as well enjoy uh, wine together because it makes life better and food tastes better too. So uh, make sure that if you enjoy our wines, you can also join our wine club and uh, it's quarterly. And after we make some uh, very small limited lots that are just for our wine club members. And eventually again, when we're able to come together, well, we host pick up fiestas at our beautiful estate here in Napa Carneros and we typically pair the wines with um, the wines that, that are being picked up by our wine club members with some authentic Mexican dishes. And make sure you also check out uh, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Facebook, on Ceja Vineyard's Facebook page, Facebook Live, Taco Tuesday, Vino y Mas, which we launched um, when we had to close our tasting room in Carneros, uh, well, we, we closed our tasting room on March 15th, and on March 31st, we launched Taco Tuesday Vino y Mas to bring back our brand of warm hospitality, Nuestra Casa es Su Casa, uh, to people's homes, so that we not only educate about food and wine pairings, uh, but also entertain and engage to think different about uh, how people should enjoy wine with food. Don't ever be intimidated. Uh, we invite you to ask a lot of questions. Uh, the more you know about wine and food, the more you like, it becomes part of your life because it just makes it so much better. And, and because it's a universal language and you share with the people that you love, surrounded with amazing food, cooking together, enjoying a glass of vino. I mean, it's, it's magical. And we, uh, it is thanks to the workers, to the Mexican labor force that were able to make these amazing world-class wines. Without, without the Mexican labor force, there wouldn't be a wine industry nor food on our table. So it is now our turn to be the voice of the voiceless, of um, 
uh, and to make sure that the contributions and the contributions to immigrants are recognized. Um, and I invite you to uh, come and visit us, to be our Goodwill Ambassador, tell your family and friends uh, to support uh, the little guys. Um, because right now it is so challenging for so many small businesses across our country. And, and we were, we're very flexible and nimble. As immigrants, we already have faced so many challenges that we've been able to, be, to remain relevant during this uh, health and financial crisis, this pandemic of COVID-19, because we literally reinvented ourselves. We bring our very lovingly curated uh, what we love to do the most. Um, recipes, authentic Mexican recipes paired with wine. So you always learn something new. So please, definitely, our wines are available on our website, sejavinyards.com. Also, you can join our wine club and you can order all of our wines for all of your needs. And we invite you, most importantly, to come and hang out with um, us. And all of our social media platforms is the same thing. Say have years on all of them, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, and um, my, on mine as well. You can also hang out with me, Amelia Seha, on all of those uh, uh, social media platforms too. But now questions. I know we have a few minutes. Hi, Amelia. Uh, Amelia, this has been one. No, I, this is Nicole. I'm back. I'm a couple glasses of wine in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read these questions coherently. And this has been a delight. I'm here with friends, and we are having the best time. They've loved the wines, um, and so thank you so much. I'm gonna try to go through a few of these. If we don't get to all of them, everyone will. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll capture them and try and send you a, a thing. I, I'll bet uh, I'll bet Amelia would be willing to go a few minutes long with us. Yes, so oh, absolutely. Was and I would love to know the answer to this. This too is if you are ever planning to do a sparkling wine. Well, we actually have made sparkling wine because we grow the varietals, which typically to make a sparkling wine. Uh, it's uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, which is a red grape. And all three of those grapes are native to Burgundy. And Carneros is the ideal location to grow all those three grape varietals. Um, but it's just as making sparkling wine is such a different process because the wine is fermented twice. The second time is to get, uh, to capture the bubbles, the effervescence. And, and we will once, well, the pandemic changed our plans. We were scheduled to break ground to build our winery here in Carneros, literally walking distance from where I'm at right here on Las Amigas Road in the Carnero side of Napa Valley. And, um, but we're hoping that we're able to do it next year because it's been approved and we're going to have a commercial kitchen. So yes. Um, and because my brother-in-law, Armando Serra, who's both a vineyardist and winemaker and went to UC Davis, so this is not accidental, he actually did internships at Domaine Chandon with Donnie Dyer, one of the world's most renowned sparkling wine makers. So yes, we, I love sparkling wine, and we collect champagne and sparkling wine, and we actually sh sell grapes to Schramsburg, some of our Carnero Chardonnays. So yes, eventually we will, again. It's just that we want to have it under control. If you don't have a, your own production facility, then it's hard to control the process. Well, I mean, honestly, I, mean, I think maybe if we could just bottle your personality, that would be enough effervescence for this. <laughs> um, someone else was asking about a difference between cor uh, wines using cork and wines with a twist-off cap. Oh, I love that question, and I'm going to show you the corks that uh, from from the wines that we opened today. So, every one of these corks cost us over a dollar. But look, if you look how dense they are, and look, I want you to see 
Well, the, you, these ones, you can't see the color because one is a rosé wine and one is a white wine. But look at the one that was according to the red wine. You should only see color in the surface that is in contact with the wine. And wine should be stored either on its side, lying on its side or upside down completely. I, we store all of our wine upside down because um, the, the liquid, the wine always has to be in contact with the cork so that the cork doesn't shrink and, and, oxy, and, and oxygen seeps in. And you shouldn't see any seepage either on the cork. But see, you pay for what you get. Um, we're, we've never used any other closures than real cork, and this comes from Portugal. And it's from a family who's been in the cork industry for all oh, 300 years. And they farm sustainably as well. Um, and it's really hard to get, and they're very expensive. So rarely are our wines ever have any defects, like TCA um, due to cork, um, infestation never hardly ever because we pay for what we get we are we will never use synthetic cork because when you have alcohol and acid i mean synthetic will leach into the wine and you know that there are a lot of studies that are being conducted already and you're going to find out that it will um and as twister we will eventually but only for two wines for our Sauvignon Blanc, because it's typically consumed uh, much sooner and um, it doesn't age for that long, and also for our Rosé. But up to now, we have never used. For any of our other wines, absolutely not. Because you, wine is a living thing. And uh, even though these are very dense, oxygen is still being exchanged very slowly over time. And that is what changes the wine inside the bottle when it's bottle aging, um, meaning that that's the chemistry changes with the exposure of very, very slowly over a long period of time. It's what softens the tannins, it what balances the wine. So no, we will use it, we've never used anything else than cork, but we will start probably uh, next vintage on only our Sauvignon Blanc, not synthetic, but screw tops and our rosé. Thank you. That's that. Actually, maybe a little bit on the same subject. If somebody was asking about storing wine, I, I don't have this problem a, a lot personally. But when you've opened a bottle, um, what's the best way to then store it in the refrigerator? Or what what type of cap um, should you use to to store wine? Um, there are a lot. There, well. There are a lot of uh, things you can buy, and we have them all, all those gadgets. Trust me, just put back the cork and put it in the fridge, and that's it. Just push it as much as you want, and then you can reopen it and put it in the fridge. Take it out um, maybe 15 minutes before you're ready to enjoy the next glass of wine, and that's it. And then wine. An open wine should be stored in the darkest, coolest part of your home, which you don't need. You don't even need one of those uh, shishi uh, wine fridges. Well, it's great if you have it, but you don't really need one. All you need to to uh, to to have is in your uh, darkest, coolest closet, um, and upside down or on the side, even under your bed. Never store wine, an open wine. Uh, where it gets a lot of light, direct or indirect, because light is the wine's worst enemy. It really is. That's why we use darker bottles on like red wines. Um, this just because it's a tradition that we use lighter uh, color bottles, but typically you don't really age rosé or Sauvignon Blanc, so it's okay. But never near uh, where there's a lot of light, in the darkest, coolest spot. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I'm going to ask a question and I have to, I'm going to ask it just exactly as it was written. Um, and then I've, I've got a couple questions that I'm going to condense about the wine glass uh, type itself. Uh, someone wrote, so Petaluma, Petaluma Gap has become a new subregion or a new AVA? Uh, Petaluma Gap was approved in 2017 by the TTB, the Trade and Tax Bureau, the uh, agency that governs um, 
believe it or not, not just alcoholic beverages, but firearms, which they don't really go together. Um, and so it takes, often it takes years to have a new ABA, American Viticultural Area, approved. Well, the Sonoma Coast ABA is very, very, very large in Sonoma, because Sonoma is five times larger than Napa. Napa is teensy, teensy, tiny, little wine growing region. So within that Sonoma Coast ABA, there is a new ABA. That region is actually an American viticultural area that was approved by the TTB that we can now use on the label. And I mentioned that we're gonna be able to use it. Oh, well, see, Petaluma Gap. This, this, the varietals, 75% of the varietals in this wine came from uh, uh, that vineyard where it was named Sonoma Coast for a very, very long time. And now just recently, uh, it, three years, it was approved. So now we can put Petaluma Gap. But you also have to put the county. So it says Sonoma County. And this wines, but except we already had these ones printed, the labels for the Sauvignon Blanc and the Rosé, because they are from the, the Syrah from the same vineyard. The, so the Merlot, the Syrah, and the Pinot Noir in this wine are from that same vineyard. Which, so this one we hadn't printed. This is the very first time we made uh, the, a red blend from the, that Petaluma Gap. So we didn't have already pre-printed labels, so we were able to use it already. So, but for the next vintages, both of these wines, instead of having Sonoma Coast, which is a much larger area, within the Sonoma Coast ABA, there's now a very small, very site-specific Peruma Gap ABA, American Viticultural Area. Well, that's, that is fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. We, we had a couple more questions about um, the wine glasses, and someone noted that it looks like the difference between kind of the general glass and the glass for Sauvignon Blanc was maybe about an inch uh, about of height. And someone else was asking about the physics of it. And I know a little bit, uh, I've uh, experienced Riedel before and I know that they went, they, they did a lot of um, experimenting about even the thickness of the glass and how wide it is and how far your nose goes into the glass. Can you talk a little bit of more about the importance of the glass and why yes. kind of the physics behind that well it's actually how if you're using the right glass you don't have to go like this because remember how to enjoy wine to capture the essence of wine automatically and then ultimately in your on, on your palate um you see how the the way it's engineering it literally is all engineering uh, which is brilliant. You see how, if you're using the little, you, the, the smaller, um, the, the smaller uh, bowl glass, you literally have to go like that. And then you're not able to really smell it. So, I, I mean, I don't know all the, but I don't know all the physics behind it, but it is um, engineer so that the way that your head tilts, that you're able to, um, like, look. If I, I don't have to tilt my head that way, like you do with most other glasses. So you're able to really smell it and taste it. So it has to do, and, and that would be um, something really wonderful to, to, to find out. But it is about how the glass was engineered so that the way that you uh, smell the wine when, when you are tasting it, that you don't have to go like that with most other glasses you do. So. That's great. I mean, I think, and that will be a fun thing for us all to experiment with yes. a little bit, I think. Um, I just wanted to let you know, we're getting lots of, uh, we've gotten lots of wonderful comments about how uh, beautiful that baby is. And um, somebody, uh, Stacy Griffin has shared, totally off topic, but we would love to work with you. So maybe we can uh, put uh, you in touch uh, together. Someone asked about, um, are there multiple vintages available for your late harvest wine? 
Um, our Lake Harvest wine, which is a Sauterne style wine, and Sauterne is um, it's in Bordeaux. It's actually a, a, a little town, an area where uh, like Sauvignon Blanc is grown in Bordeaux. And then it was a pure accident. Grapes were left on the vine. Um, and after the, the bricks, the amount of sugar went really, really high, like later uh, after harvest. Um, and then this, this mold developed and it shriveled the grape and he, and he grew this little white fuzz. It looks really ugly. And you think, I'm gonna drink a wine made out of that, but oh my God, it's sublime. And you only extract about one drop per berry and Mother Nature doesn't cooperate every year. We've only been able to make it four vintages. And so we only have our current vintage, I think it's 2009. If you go to our website and it's called Dulce Beso, Literally, most wineries that make a late harvest wine, they don't care if it's if Mother Nature doesn't allow the mold. You can actually artificially uh, like start the mold, um, but we don't because the wine tastes different. And it's 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 this wine that is well, it's it has so much acid because every drop that is extracted is pure acid, different types of acid, tartaric, malic, da 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 all kinds of acids, and uh, sugar and flavors. And so you need that residual sugar to balance that high concentration of acid because otherwise you would eat the enamel of your teeth. And typically the alcohol is very, I, I think it's like 11.9 or 12, if at all, and it is fantastic. Think about it like before dinner with uh, like your favorite artisanal cheeses or after dinner. Um, I love it before and after dinner uh, with, with a lot of, because I love cheese. And it is amazing. So I think that whatever the current vintage uh, that is there, uh, which it might be 2009 or 2010, because we've only been able to make it for vintages, 2006, but we saved 25 cases. Oh, and this wine is going to outlive all of us. Because remember what the best preservative in any food, what, what it is, is acid and sugar, which is all natural in these uh, grapes that were harvested at a very high bricks that have a lot of acid as well. So those wines will be absolutely stunning in 50 years. They're fantastic now. Um, we have a friend, a wine club member that is a big collector uh, from LA, and he brought us um, a Chateau de Quem. That is the world's most famous late harvest wine from Saturn in Bordeaux, that President Lincoln was president. <laughs> But he spent like $20,000 on this bottle. And you could still taste the fruit. I was so, oh my gosh, it was stunning. It was really quite lovely. That's wonderful. Uh, Thank you. For I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask three more, three more questions if you're oh, willing to stay with us for about five minutes. Of course. Oh, of course. Um, someone was asking about, you know, when a wine kind of goes a little bit stinky or is that always a sign that it's gone bad? Has it been corked? What, what can you tell us about that? Okay, so wine that is properly handled uh, while it's being, well, while it was pressed, then barrel age or whether, typically most red wine is fermented in stainless steel. Yeah, but once it goes through alcoholic fermentation, and red wine does go through malolactic fermentation because otherwise you wouldn't really be able to drink it for a very, for, you, it, it's, it would be really, 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 really acidic. While white wine, we don't, I don't like white wine that is allowed to go uh, uh, to malolactic fermentation because then it's like buttery, etc. cetera. But so, um, wine that is properly handled through the entire process of winemaking does not have defects. And if you spend the money to making sure that there is proper hygiene and that you use the right cork, you will never have any defects. But uh, 
typically, um, and, and, not, and not all wine, but I find a lot more defects in wine that is um, produced on mass, like, like that it might be fermented in like, uh, where, like tanks that are, that maybe feed a hundred tons of grapes, or that is, all of the process is mechanized, and then uh, that the cork is uh, maybe not the right cork or synthetic cork or screw tops. Um, so the reason why, why these wines that we make in small lots and that are touched by a lot of people are fantastic and you don't ever find any defects is because there's a lot of work to make these beautiful wines. So yes, um, that sometimes like if the cork, if, if you have like the perfect trifecta of uh, chlorine, uh, mold, and a cork that maybe once it was harvested from the alcornoque, which is the name of the tree that you harvest the cork, uh, that, that maybe was dried in the, in, in, um, in an area that it was infected with a bacteria or something, and then you 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 buy it and you bring it into the cellar, and somehow it is in uh, contact with chlorine. Well, then that is going to yield uh, a corked wine, which is like this wet dog, wet animal smell. It's not pleasant. I mean, I don't even have to taste it. I mean, that's why when I open a bottle of wine, the first thing I do is I, I, I pour myself a tiny little bit or I just smell the wine directly in the bottle. And I, I can detect it. I'm very sensitive to it. So, and, and it doesn't have to be just that. There are so many other defects that can happen too. But it is... If, it, if the wine is not handled properly, hygienically properly throughout the entire process, there are going to be wines, about 20% of the wines are not going to be okay. But you know how often, I mean, we warranty all of our wines. If you find, if you order a wine and you find a defect and you think something's off, we will send you another bottle. And guess how often that happens? Like, never because we spend a lot of money and a lot of time and we only use small tanks. We only use really great um, barrels, really great corks. We really pay attention and then uh, you prevent any of those defects from happening. But you can't really do that when you produce uh, hundreds of thousands of cases. That is impossible. Are your wines available in retail or um, just from your vineyard? Uh, well, no, our wines are available online at our website. You can order them and we should, most of the wine that we sell, like 75% mm, of the wine that we sell, we ship. Uh, the only two states that we don't ship to is, uh, well, are Utah and Mississippi. And that's because they're special. Um, but we're but we, not Mississippi. I feel sorry. I hope not. <laughs> we'll, we'll let our alumni know. <laughs> yeah. But we do have our wines, some of our limited produced wines, maybe three in some Total Wine and More stores. They, Total Wine and More, Lab Serra Vineyards, but they can keep enough of, of our inventory and they typically only carry our. Uh, legendary Serra Pinot Noir, our Vino de Casa, and our Chardonnay. That's it. But but it's really hard. That, and so if you have a total wine and more store near you, you can call and you should demand to carry more of our other varietals. Um, but literally, it's so easy. You can just order it online and become a wine club member or come and visit us. And we also offer curbside pickup. At our tasting room here in Carneros Napa, Monday through Thursday from 11 to 3. Well, speaking of uh, then getting to come pick it up, someone was asking, what, what would you recommend pairing with, and I would love to know this as well, uh, beef tamales and uh, a mole? Oh, my gosh. Well, mole and blends, or the, any blends with Syrah, actually are... Our Merlot, our Seja Merlot. And this goes for tamales as well, because I love tamales too. Oh, yummy. Um, 
So, Merlot, our vino de casa, our, um, all of our Bordeaux blends, Oxomo, Metzli, Mezcla 54, oh, our, our Cabernet Sauvignon and Mole, oh, is one of those rare, perfect culinary marriages that rarely exist in real life. Thank you. We, uh, this is going to be our final question of the day. Someone was asking about the fires, and uh, one, we hope that you're okay, your friends, family, fellow Ventners are, are okay, but they were wondering um, also then how, how does that affect the grapes and the, and the flavor? You, you know, you, you were all listening, and you all have great questions. That means you really love wine. I'm so glad to hear that and know that. Well, in the since 2017 so that's literally to, up to this year 2020 we've had um fires in Bo, in napa in sonoma lake county mendocino and i we i personally know napa valley residents that have had to that were displaced and had to be evacuated all for years i know a lot i have friends that have lost everything i know wineries that in this glass fire um that were destroyed it's it's really really sad um and it's impacted workers wineries the entire uh north bay of napa and sonoma lake and mendocino counties um, the cli I mean, climate change is here, and we really need to do something about it. We needed to do something about it 20 years ago, but now this is really, really prevalent. And now in Southern California, so the glass fire, which started in August, it, we have already fortunately harvested our Pinot Noir grapes because they are an early ripening varietal. But we're located in Southern Napa and Sonoma County, so far away from the mountains and the, uh, a, a lot of the forest, where it is where most of the fires happen, where there's a lot of fuel. So um, we're very fortunate that um, none of our vineyards or our grapes were impacted. We sent all of our grapes from all of our vineyard sites to be tested for um, smoke taint and none of our grapes were uh, infected. So I, I, it's amazing, but sadly, so many owners of uh, vineyards and wineries who are located in the area where the glass fire ravaged that they literally last 2020 vintage is non-existent zero because there's there the smoke permeates the juice and is not a pleasant experience why are you going to spend so much money making this wine when it's going to be compromised so uh sadly many 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 napa and sonoma vintners are not going to be making a 2020 vintage we are just one of those very fortunate that we have been, um, we've, we've never been uh, close to a vineyard, well, to a fire. In 2017, when we had the police knock on our door uh, like 3 a.m. and I rushed outside, I could see all the fires raging, but far away uh to to the east i could on the in the vaca range i could see two north the patrick fire then west uh in sonoma actually two fires there at the on the same night it was it was horrific but the closest that he got the patrick fire like that we're close to the carnero cn of highway 12 it had to be it was mandatory evacuation so it was probably about a um, mile and a half north of us, that was the closest, and that was in 2017. Uh, the, then, con consequently, the next two uh, fires, 2018, 2019, 
yeah, we could see them, but they were not close. And this one, we could definitely smell it. And I posted uh, this video on Instagram where this one day, oh my gosh, my husband and I, Pedro and I, we woke up and we thought it was the middle of the night because of the smoke. But it was early in the season, and then it was like, we're close to the San Pablo, San Francisco Bay. It's always windy, so everything just like, like, there's a lot of wind that is pushed out of this area. So all of our grapes from all of our vineyards that we own, uh, they, they meticulously have been sent to labs, and there is zero um, smoke taint. I... We're, we're so happy to to hear that you were you were spared and um, I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of all the gators here tonight that in a, in a very hard year you have been a, a incredibly bright spot this this evening has been an absolute delight you are a joy your your family and your story are so strong and an example of everything that we all should strive to be so I want to thank you so very, very much for your incredible presentation, your wonderful wines, which I continue to enjoy, and we're about to have dinner. And, um, you know, please, <laughs> we would love to have you back any time. Uh, this, this has been a, a, a real, uh, what, uh, just a fantastic evening. Thank you so, so very much. You, you, well, have, you hold a special place in all of our Gator hearts. Well, thank you and count me in. And uh, San Francisco State has played a major role in our life as well. It's not just uh, my, da my beloved daughter, Dalia Seha and her husband, Chase, but her cousin uh, as well, who is also involved in the wine industry. So, um, Many other friends. So San Francisco State has been is a beacon of light, and we will forever support it. And we also appreciate your support very, very much. And go Gators! Okay. And vote. 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 Yes, thank you. Go Gators! Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We're gonna we're gonna sign off, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Gracias y salud.